Let's return to This Week in America. Here's your host, Rick Bratton. Welcome back, everybody. Coast to coast, This Week in America. Rave reviews for the science fiction and fantasy intros where the spirits speak by R.H. Martin, called the great mixture of spirituality and science fiction, characters with unfailingly accurate human emotions and thinking, filled with many provoking spiritual messages and simple wisdom. Randy H. Martin was born in Anniston, Alabama, received a B.S. from Jacksonville State University, an M.S. in biology from the University of Alabama in Birmingham. He taught biology as an adjunct professor at Gadsden State Community College, as a full-time professor at Jacksonville State University. He's also taught biology, physics, physical science, government, and economics, computer science and chemistry at Jacksonville Christian Academy, worked as a quality control chemist in manufacturing and research, and in the testing of drugs for cancer treatments. Randy and his wife reside in the Appalachian foothills of northeast Alabama. He's the founder of G-O-W-I-H-M Group, whose sole purpose is to get old wisdom into young hands. I'm all for that. R.H. Martin, author of Introverse, Where the Spirits Speak, joining us on This Week in America. Randy, welcome to the program. It's great to have you with us. Thank you, Rick. Thanks for having me. We'll talk in a little bit about uh, us older people and our wisdom and passing that along. That'll come later on in the program. I'm looking forward to having that discussion as well. It's a pleasure to have you with us on the program today. And what an impressive background you have. Just exactly what was the inspiration to start writing and to continue that writing to this day with everything you've uh, in the background? Why was writing something that was so uh, important to you? Well, it really didn't become important. Uh, until I really started getting into the story. And it was just something to take up time because I was bored where I was working. I had a lot of free time. But then it got it started getting very interesting as to the characters and what kind of characters needed to be brought into the story. Uh, how was this going to turn out? What was, how was it going to end? And then I realized along the way that what was coming out of this were, were some basic truths and some basic wisdom and that was very beneficial to me and I really wanted to share it because as individuals, we're, there's, we're so unique. Each of us is so unique. There's not another person, there's not another Rick Bratton in the universe. There's, and I, a lot of this stuff in the book is to get you to realize your eternally infinite potential. And, and to begin on that journey, uh, I hope that, that insurers can give people something to think about that they might not ordinarily think about that would cause them to realize that infinite eternal potential that they have. Well, in reading all of the reviews, that's exactly what you've done. You've entertained, you've challenged, you got people to, uh, to give some thought that something they normally probably wouldn't have. Introverse is the name of the book, Where the Spirits Speak, by Randy R.H. Martin, our guest on the program. The book is available at strattonpress.com in their bookstore. You'll find it uh, wherever books are sold, and you can link on directly by going to our website, thisweekinamerica.us. When you started this writing process, decided, I've got some time, I've got some thoughts, I'd like to start writing, why did you de- uh, determine you it was going to be science fiction? How did that come about? Well, science is supposed to be a body of knowledge, which is absolutely true. And fiction, obviously, is something which is not true. And I think it, the contrast between the two brings about some, can bring about some awesome entertainment and thought-provoking things. And there are three, three authors that I think uh, have done a great job with that. C.S. Lewis, uh, Tolkien, and Frank Herbert's Dune series, uh, I think what they did that made their writing so influential on me was they didn't limit truths by scientific materialism. Uh, there are truths outside of the material world. Yes. But our, our main body of science now, our mainstream science now, wants to limit it to materialism. And I think the other thing that they did, which was paramount in them producing the the fine works that they produced that they wrote was they didn't limit spirituality. Their spirituality was not limited by religion. Interesting concept Uh, with us on the program is Randy R.H. Martin talking about the book intros where the spirits speak. 
so many scenes that that come alive as you're reading this book. And by the way, I believe it's your first novel. What are some of the, the favorite scenes that uh, that you enjoyed writing and sharing with the with those of us who uh, who are readers? Well, one, there are several things that really caused me to smile. Uh, but one of them was this this old man. He comes across as old man, but he's actually the individual who created the planet. And he's actually from Earth. Uh, but he was executed at one point in time. And when he went over to the spirit realm, he asked God to teach him and what he wanted to know. And he wanted to know how to create a, a planet. And, a, and obviously, you need a solar system. But anyway, he comes across as this old man. And this young man who is on the planet, he's an inhabitant of the planet Hytra, uh, he dies. And they're sitting out on the front porch of a cabin in rocking chairs. And the old man asked the young man, he says, do you know what's really good about rocking chairs? And he says, well, no, not really, I don't. He said that you can go travel so far without going anywhere. <laughs> and he says, do you know what the bad thing about rocking chairs is? And he said, well, no, I really don't. He said, you can travel so far without going <laughs> anywhere. He said, it's all about perspective. Exactly. Exactly. It's just, so many great moments like that as you're reading the book Introers, where the spirits speak by by R. H. Martin. So that when you develop a uh, a scene like that in your mind, how, how do you do that? Is that just uh, almost a gift where you you basically, I guess, have a vision or these thoughts come to you because that that really is so well done. There's a in the second novel. There's a epigraph. Uh, that says, I have come to realize all I thought, all the thoughts I hear do not originate with me. And so when you, the, if you look at the title of the book, Introverse, it's a botanical term. It means to face inward toward the central axis of growth where the spirits speak. So what the title implies is, is that we have a telepathic uh, possibility, if you want to put it that way, right. with beings from the spirit dimension. And depending on which ones, which voice we listen to, and that's not to eliminate the fact that we have thoughts, our own thoughts. But I think a lot of the material, I could, there are several things that actually happened during the writing of the book where the information that came to me for some of the things, like the name of the, the ocean that migrates around the planet, it is the name of it is the melisma. And when I wrote the name of that sea down, uh, I had no idea what the word Melissa meant. I didn't know if it was a real word. So I looked it up here recently, and actually it's a musical term that means to hold a single syllable through multiple notes. It is the perfect name for that ocean because that ocean migrates through three different governmental provinces. So I I just can't help, I know for a fact, that some of that... I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, no, I, I was just going to say, that's amazing how that happens. And there were parts of the book that, that, that we've talked about, a couple there, that, that almost, as I'm listening to you, I would put, not necessarily, I just say easy, but sort of came naturally to you. Were there parts of the book that were, that were more difficult to, to write? Yes. Uh, actually, the antagonist... Um, he he was uh, Saurav Bajan. He's a very bad guy, and he does some very very terrible things. And one of the things that he did, which was very disturbing to write, was he took this individual. Uh, there's a fisherman's legend that says when one of the C9 fishermen dies at sea, his soul and spirit gets caught in this mist at the tail end of the sea called Loch Sodron. So Saurav Bajan thinks, okay, I have found the key to bringing mankind into immortality. I can kill people in this mist, capture their soul and spirit, repair their body, bring them back to life, and they they will live forever and never have to die again. And one of the things he does is he takes this young man uh, and he kills him in the spirit and, and he's going to put him back into a body, but he divides his soul and spirit. He cuts it, in, cuts it into 25% and 75% because he wants some of this man's talents and abilities. And then he takes that part in. That was very difficult to write. It left me uh, and, and very despondent, to put it mildly. So it actually was draining for you as the writer 
as you're there putting those words, uh, I'm going to say on paper, computer, or whatever, that took its toll emotionally, it sounds like, on you. It did, absolutely. Uh, it was it was difference between night and day when I could write a, write a scene that was uplifting, uh, that was humorous. There was one scene where the grandfather, the, uh, the father, and the son are out fishing, and it's just hilarious. And I, I laugh every time I read it. <laughs> and then there's, and I would get up from that, and I would feel really good. And then I'd have to write scenes like that right there because you need the contrast. You have to create the contrast uh, between good and evil. And I would get up from the other ones, and I would just have to walk around the house for a while to try to get back into a good feeling. But I, w- I want to mention one other thing here about good and evil. There's a third uh, dimension to this. Uh, we generally limit most of what we think about morally from a good and evil point of view. Yes. But there's a verse in Proverbs that says, God created the, everything for himself, even the wicked for the day of evil. And Calvinists and a lot of other people assume that those wicked are predestined people, pe- people pre- predestined to go to hell. But we make an assumption there that these wicked are people. And I went the other way. I created a race of people called the Fossics, uh, and they're wicked. And what's really interesting to me is these wicked are spirit scavengers, and they're coming after evil spirits, and they will consume them. But the righteous are an abomination to them, and yet they're serving the righteous. Talk about the Fossics, because... These people are, are interesting. You've got, uh, uh, well, you sort of describe, talk about that aspect of that and, and an artist providing images. Describe that that process. Well, Jason Wright is the one who illustrated, who had the images. Uh, I just described the, what type of beings they were, spirit scavengers, and Jason Wright drew them, and there are four class, classes of them uh, that he drew. They're scouts educators, uh, Annecy, uh, I'm trying to think of the fourth one, but anyway, they're very beautiful creatures. They, they will come across to you as beautiful, and but they have their struggles also, and one of their struggles is they want to find out who created them, so they're looking for that. Uh, they've been relying totally on logic, but they've gone through a famine, and so the leader of the Fossics, Bruja, uh, She's a very beautiful creature, and she um, decides to make a faith decision. And it really throws them kind of into a loop, but it works out for them. And eventually, well, they end up on Hytra. Uh, They help kind of bring things to an end on Hytra. But they're also headed to Earth. And and when you go to the second novel, uh, the sequel, uh, Entros, The King's Whisper, that ends all all the events on Hydra, and, we, and it doesn't end. I don't think it's going to end like anybody think it is, thinks it is when they're reading the novel. But anyway, and then there's a, an event, a somewhat serendipitous event takes place that brings one of the Fossics and two of her Annecy's with her to Earth. This is just a, an amazing story. We're talking about Intros, Where the Spirits Speak by R.H. Martin, our guest on the program. Uh, book available wherever books are sold. I'll direct you to Stratton Press in their book section there. You mentioned the sequel. Is that available now as well? It is. Uh, I, I, there are two editions of the first novel. And the first one was published in 05, and then we just recently done the one, one with Stratton Press with Stratton Press has done an awesome job with everything to cover. Uh, and I, I think it needed to editing. I think the second novel with the old man sitting on the porch and the young man standing there about to make his faith run across the salt plain. And the salt plain it goes around the entire equator of the planet, and that's what the sea migrates from. And it's based on good physics. Uh, but the second novel, uh, the sequel to it, it's such, it was such a detailed story that I just couldn't put it into one novel. Uh, and then there's a third one that, that's coming along with it called Pertinae's Garden. And Pertinae is one of, is the Fosse, one of the Fosses. It's a, I don't know, there's so much going on in the, in the novel. Yes. It's a, there's a lot of ideas, there's a lot of concepts, a lot of stuff to try to get you to think about. Like I said, uh, 
this is really what I wanted to do was I wanted to create a work of fiction that would cause people to value the truth. And you've done that. It's uh, so remarkable. And I'm not sure there's anything ever been done quite like this. Intros, where the spirit speak, is the first in the uh, the series by our guest in the program, R.H. Martin. A, a couple minutes left in the show. When you when you do something like this, especially it falls maybe into that groundbreaking category, you get uh, people who like it, rave reviews, and then there's a, a literary critic from time to time that that isn't quite into the concept. How do you handle that? You've got your vision. You know where you want to take the story. How do you handle uh, criticism? I think you have to handle criticism in a very positive way because a lot of, you can learn a lot from anything. Yes. And if, if somebody offers some criticism, they may be showing you something that you might have done, could have done better or could do better. So you don't ever discount somebody just because they're telling you something you don't want to, you might not want to hear. But you talked about originality, and, and I think part of the things in our cult, prosperous culture, somebody said this a long time ago, and there was an article talked about the cloning of America. One of the things about our culture, and this is another thing, too, that I would really, I have really tried to do, is we have a lot of reruns uh, in a prosperous culture. Nobody wants to change anything because most of what we've been doing has brought prosperity. But if we don't seek out some change, it just can't get better. R.H. Martin, our guest on the program, and it's interesting you talk about change. You were an atheist for, I believe, five years. I, I read 1976 through 1981. Obviously, that had changed. Talk about the the change, the transition that you went through during that period. Well, it was an awesome transition. I was a very bad individual. Uh, I had no boundaries. And I absolutely got convinced. Now, I'm a very objective individual, and I had an event take place that left no doubt. I have absolutely no doubt that God exists. Uh, what I did was I said, okay, now that I know you exist, uh, I want to start all over learning about you. Because one of the things that led to me to atheism were the, a lot of the contradictions I saw in religious people. And so I don't, I know now that God is not, so much about religion, although there are a lot of religious people who do a lot of good things, and there's a lot of religions that do a lot of good things. But I think the heart of the matter lies in our spiritual nature. As yes, I, I can't I, say enough about coming out of atheism into into faith in God. It's uh, and it's it's not anything. It's, it doesn't have really anything to do with religion. That's interesting. I was sort of letting that sink in there to me and for the audience as you're mentioning that, because uh, so many people do the opposite, that, uh, you know, faith is a, a structured religious belief. And it's fascinating your, where you were, where you've come from during the course of the really the last several decades. A minute or so left in the program. I mentioned about the group Get Old Wisdom into Young Hands. Uh, talk about the concept behind that, because it really is important. It really is important, uh, and it's a very, to me, it's very common sense. Yes. That if we don't take care of the generation that's coming up behind us, then that destroys the future. And wisdom is not a static thing, and it's a relative thing. And one of the pieces of wisdom that comes to mind, I think this is a very basic piece of wisdom, uh, and it's a very short thought. But if you if you compare good and evil. Uh, Evil, because it has no boundaries, limits us. Now, this may not make any sense right on the surface, and it took me a long while to understand this. But evil, because it has no boundaries, limits us. And because righteousness has limits, it makes us infinite. And I, I couldn't understand that for a while. But then what it came down to basically was, was uh, two words, order and chaos. Because in, in intros, what you find out is, is that evil constantly delivers chaos. And righteousness constants, constantly delivers order. And so when you talk about getting old wisdom into young minds, what you're doing is you're creating a stability in the individual. And it's impossible to have stability in a culture if you don't have order and stability 
in the individuals that make up the culture. Yes. Just common sense wisdom. And well, once again, wisdom is a relative thing. I ran into a, an individual the other day who's a senior over here at Jack State University, and I was talking to him. He's a very neat guy, very wise. I said, you know, if I had had somebody to talk to like you, when I first started the college, I wouldn't have wasted a lot of time. I had no self-discipline. I did not know how to study. So you, as a senior, and you're doing well, if you would talk to some of these freshmen and sophomores that are coming in here and tell them, give them your wisdom, it could make a big difference in their lives. Well, the time has gone by so quickly. So much there. And Intrors is the book by R.H. Martin we're talking about. That's I-N-T-R-O-R-S-E, Intrors, Where the Spirits Speak. The book is such a fascinating read. It will make you stop and think. A week after you finish the book, two weeks after you finish the book, you'll be stopping and thinking about something you read in, uh, in this book, Intours, Where the Spirits Speak by R.H. Martin. Randy, it's been a pleasure having you on the program. Uh, continued success in reaching people with, uh, with these ideas in the first two books, and uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to do this again. Thank you for being with us on the program. Thank you very much, Rick. I've, I've really enjoyed it. It time went by too quickly. So much to talk about. Randy R. H. Martin, our guest. The book is Intros Where the Spirit Speak, available where books are sold. I'll direct you to strattonpress.com in their books section. You can link on directly by going to our website, thisweekinamerica.us. And we're back on today's program right after these messages. This Week in America is online. You can visit our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Scott Pinkerton, associate producer of This Week in America. Jay Anderson, segment producer. Ben Watson, webmaster. Otto Bache, director of engineering and TV production. This Week in America produced and is a trademark of Blue Funk Broadcasting, LLC. For information on all of our guests and to listen to this week's show, our website again at thisweekinamerica.us. And I'm Sean Bratton, executive producer of This Week in America.